the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings in chapter 6. 2 Kings, what book did I say? 2 Kings in chapter 6. And I know it's on the screen, but I know some people like myself love to feel the holy pages in their hands. So I am going to allow you time to get to that place. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to pitch our tents between verses 1 and 7. 2 Kings chapter 6. As you are turning, as you are turning, I have to tell you and confess that when I was asking the Lord about my situations, I always open the Bible and where I lay my eyes, the first place I lay my eyes, I feel that the Lord is speaking to me. So I opened my Bible and I laid my eyes on this scripture. And this scripture, I said, I don't get anything from it, Lord. I don't understand what you're trying to say. So I closed the book and I prayed and I opened the book again and he laid me right here. So what I am going to do for you today is give it to you like the Lord gave it to me. Second Kings, chapter six, verses one through seven in the Bible reads that the sons of the prophets said to Elijah, please notice that the place where you where, where we live under your supervision is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan where we can eat, get a log and can build ourselves a place to live there. Go, he said. Then one said, please come with your servants. I will come, he answered. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, oh, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, the man of God cut a stick, threw it there and made the iron float. Then he said, pick it up. So he reached out and he took it. Please let us pray as we pray over the topic. I have an ax to grind. Our Father and our God, this is your time. I can only give what you have given me. So I thank you, Lord, for choosing me at this time. And I'm asking, Lord, that as I have gotten the lesson out of this, that so your people will hear a word from you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. An axe to grind is a, is a statement or a slogan or a saying. It's to have a grievance with someone, especially where one feels the need to seek damaging retribution. The phrase probably originates from the act of sharpening an axe with a grinding wheel with the intent to get revenge on someone by maiming or killing them. And that's to grind. So when the Lord gave me this passage, I didn't know what to do with it. I'm be honest with you. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. He said, look again. So I read it. And then for some reason, I went off into this thought of how my mother bakes a cake. See, my mother never did open up a box and add some milk and add some eggs. My mother had tools. And I remember this one little metal container that had a handle, and it had a little, a little handle on the side of it. And she used to put her flour in this thing, and she used to hit the side of it, and then she'd get to sifting it. Then, so the flour's gone. Then she'll take the flour and put it back in there and hit the side and start flipping it again. And I don't know what she was doing. All the cake bakers in this place, I don't know what she was doing. That's probably a conversation that we need to have. But when she was done, it was the best cake ever. 
She used to lay her ingredients out on the tables, the butter and the milk and the eggs. And I don't know why she doesn't take the eggs straight from the refrigerator, but she used to have it sitting there. I don't know if you had to let it cool down. Oh, go ahead on. Yeah, you had to settle. <laughs> you had to settle. But I went into that thing. And the Lord said, listen, I want you to set the ingredients out. And after you set the ingredients out, we're going to start putting the ingredients together. We're going to mix that thing up. And then we're going to bake it. So I'm telling you, in this message, which will be short because we do have hands today, I am going to set this thing out. I'm going to mix it up how the Lord gave it to me. And we're going to bake this thing. It says that the sons of the prophets said to Elijah, Give us permission to go down and cut some trees by the Jordan because this place is too small for us. First, we have to identify who is the sons of prophets. Historians say that the sons of prophets, the sons of prophets were chosen by God to minister to the people, especially of Judea and of Bethel. The reason why he chose these sons of prophets, these special men, was because the Levites and the priests of that day were so corrupt that the people could not see the movement of God. Some commentaries say that in this very corrupt time, God did not wholly forsake the Israelites, but he continued a school of prophets among them, which will be trained up and employed in the ways of the temple. That in spite of the rejection of holy or righteous ways, God, in a time where man did things that seemed right in their own eyes, you know, when back room deals were cut, when it was hard to see the line between world business and church business, when it was when, 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 when the lines were blurred, God said he still reserved a people that was still shut out from the top of their voice that this is the way of the Lord. Follow him and he will direct your path. It's in this time that God set a people aside. And for me, I was like, okay. He said, listen, set the ingredients out. When Moses when Moses took the people out of Egypt, he formed them in bloodlines. And the Levites, the Levites were supposed to take care of the holy things of God. It was their strict responsibility. All things that took place in the temple was done by the Levites. And as time went on, here you run into the sons of prophets who despite how corrupt the world was, they then took on the role of taking care of the things in the temple. As we go on through history, we realize that the disciples was given the commission to take care of the holy things of God. After Christ died, that was passed on to both Jew and Gentile, and they called them Christians. I'm just setting the table. Christians are supposed to take on the same role. But the Lord showed me, Maurice, I want you to see how the different groups may have changed in name and diversity, but the principles remain the same. So even in 2000, 2016, Christians are supposed to still take on the role of ushering in the holy men of God. See, the Levites' duties was to not only protect, but also prepare the way, especially in the temple of the East Gate. The East Gate was where the holy priest, the high priest, walked in. That's when he administered and he started doing all the ministries that was needed to save and forgive the sins of the people. Here today in 2016, there is a high priest that is still coming back for his people. And we have been given the commission. We have been given the duty to prepare and protect the East Gate. 
For the Bible says that he that shall come will come. He will not tarry. And they said, just as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so all shall see the Son of God. We are protectors of the East Gate. I said, okay, Lord. So as I read on, I realized that the space that they needed was too small. But I didn't read, read anywhere where they start growing the size. I didn't read anywhere where, where, they, where they were just adding on to the group to the point that the place was just too, too small and they need to expand the room. I didn't read anywhere where all of a sudden this group was small, but yet they grew up. And because they were small in this space and they were little kids in this space, they grew up to grown men and women and the place became too small. I didn't read anywhere. And I said, Lord, what is this? The space start getting too small, if you will allow me. I would say that even in the house of God, no matter how big the room, when you sit there and you're doing nothing, all of a sudden, nerves start getting stepped on. I will say that if you find a house of God that are fighting among each other, I would tell you that's a house of God that is not working. I will go and say that in this place, these people, these men of God that were just sitting here was, was, was getting aggravated and was getting agitated with one another, that, that they, were, they were tripping on one another. The space was getting too small. Every time I'm in the kitchen, you're in the kitchen. We, who drunk up all the orange juice? Who was the last one to take a bath and didn't clean the tub? Whose shoes are these that almost tripped down the steps? The space were getting too small. I don't understand why the financial committee did that. I don't understand what the elders are thinking. What was the pastor thinking? Because the room is getting too small. So they said, let us go to the Jordan, cut out some beams that we may build a space for ourselves. Elijah said, go. I believe that Elijah, Elijah knew that the only way, the only way that ministry can be done if you go and work out your frustration. I believe that Elijah heard a word from God and said, go, go. Go and work out your frustrations. So they went, but one said, Master, come with us. Master, come with us. Somebody say, Master, come with us. Master, come with us. So as they were down there, still setting things out, as they were down there, they started cutting down trees. One was cutting a tree, and the axe head fell off into a water, and he cried out with a shout, Lord, it was borrowed. He said, show me where it was, and he showed him where it was, and he threw a stick in the water and made the axe head rise. I said, Lord, what is this that you're trying to tell me? He said, I want you to look at the trees. What is the trees? And he started mixing this thing up for me. He said, the trees are the people that have placed in your path. They don't know which direction they should go. I have purposely allowed them to cross your path so that you can chop down the obstacles that are stopping them from getting to me. It is you that is salt in this world. It is you that is light in this world. You are the Christian that I have called. And because of, uh, because of a death in the family or because of a wayward child, because of an addiction, they have trees that are blocking them from getting to me. It is your job and your duty to cut those trees down that they may have access to me. But in the process, you know how it was when you first saw the light. You know how it was when God first came to you. You know that sermon, you know that song, you know that situation. When God first visits you and you say, Lord, I am wholly yours. Use me. 
That moment, that moment, that moment, you declared that I will do your bidding. You declare, the Lord, whatever you say, I will do. Wherever you send me, I will go. I am yours. I am all yours. You said that. So he sent you the sister who just was put out by her, by her estranged boyfriend from beating her. And, and you allowed her because you are this Christian to come and stay with you for a while. But it seemed like she's not getting a job. It seemed like she is eating up all your food. It seemed like when you get up to go to work that she's still in the house. It seemed like everything is going wrong. Then when she get a little change. You come home, you find your stuff messed up. She's gone and her kids. Just to find out that she's back with the rascal that put her out. So you're through with her. You're done. God said, God said that I have placed them in your path. These are the trees. But what were the trees to do? The trees were made for being. The King James Version says that they asked him to cut out beams, beams, so they can build room and space. These beams had to be made. They had to be fashioned. When you cut the tree down, you had to then peel the bark. When you peel the bark, you had to take off all the notches. And when you till it, you had to make it smooth. You had to make it usable. He said, work with my children. Work with my children. You know the son that you have been given advice to, the son that you have raised, the son or daughter, Lord, that you have that, that you have poured your all into, you have poured all of your resources, your hard earned resources into. And these jokers, when they get of age, think they're big and bad enough to do whatever they want to do. Now your advice is your advice is not good enough. Now they can just move anywhere they want to. And when they find themselves at the at the after they have destroyed the bridge that you have built with them, after they have told you their business, after they have, they have, after they have did what they wanted to do, now they find themselves in a hard situation. You want to say, I told you so. You want to say, forget that. You want to say, let them, let them learn. But these are trees that God has placed in your path. You, you, Christian. You, the one that's supposed to take on the duties of the Lord. You, you, the one who, was, who asked for the assignment. God showed you an encounter with him. And you said, I want to be yours. So he said, if you want to be mine, it comes with something. And he gave you an assignment. But because it's not panning out the way that you thought it was going to pan out, Maurice. Because you have set your own things in place and realized that the things that you have set in place was not the right thing. Now, you want to just throw it all away. But you said that I'll be wholly yours. You asked me to direct your path, I directed it. You asked me to save you, I'm saving you. All the things that you asked me to do, I have held to the promise. You, you said that you would take on these duties. And like you want to hold God accountable, he must also hold you accountable. That's the deal. That's the deal. So these trees, these trees that they're cutting down and fashioning into beings, were people that set in our path. But then I said, so what's up with the axe head? I mean, he lost the axe head in the water. What's up with the axe head? The axe head, the axe head was the ability that he has given you, the tools that he has shown you, the tools he has he, he, he has gifted to you to do the work that he expects you to do. That axe head. Let me mix this thing on up. Oftentimes, and I have to talk about me because it was about me, so forgive me, not being selfish, but sharing you my testimony. 
Every time that I try to do things, I claim that it was because the Lord is telling me to do it. But sometimes I have to admit, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be, <laughs> be serious about this thing, I have to admit that sometimes I see it and I say, you know what, it'd be best done this way. I don't see the Lord really working in. I don't see him really intervening. I don't see him really doing what I asked him to do. So I'm going to help him along. And when I help him along, I always find myself in a rut. I always find myself with my back against the wall and opposition's coming at me at all sides. So the Lord said, the Lord said, Maurice, you have found yourself in a situation where you need more space. So I have put people in your lives so that you can work out your frustrations. You can work out the salvation of the Lord. And these people, these people will not always be there for you. These people will sometimes get on your nerves. These people will test your limit. These people will aggravate you. These people will suck you dry of your resources. These people. But I placed them there so that you can bear your cross. You know, the Bible says that we should every day bear our cross. We should pick up a cross every day. And you know, sometimes, and, and, and I was taught that these are struggles in my life, that these are barriers that, 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 that seem to block me from getting to God, that these are situations that the Lord will put me in that will test my, my Christianity. If I can, I would tell you that that cross that you're bearing, what the Lord told me, that that cross that I'm bearing has nothing to do with me. That cross that I'm bearing, that cross that I'm bearing and picking up every day is to take on the burdens of others. That, that cross every day that I pick up will take on the burden, the burdens of my son, my daughter, will take on the burdens of my neighbor that, 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 that seem to cuss me out every time she get a chance for no apparent reason. The, the, the burdens that I face has to deal with my brothers and sisters in the house of God that seem to always dog your footsteps, your burdens, that cross that you bear. It's to show others the love of Christ. For Christ already bared your cross. Back on Calvary, when he died for you and me, he, he, he made provisions for us. And when we signed up, he said that my grace is sufficient. He said that I have done a good work. He said that I have covered you. And if we are to be Christ's example, if we are to be Christ-like, we must do the same. We must cover others. We must show others the way to salvation. We must show others how to get back to the master's house. For he told me, he said, Maurice, I have already prepared room for those who said that they were Christians. For the righteous, I have prepared room to my father's house. Since you want to be like me, you must show others the room that you must make for them. These beams, these beams, they said that when, cross, when, when Christ died on the cross, when he died as he was going through the city, that it wasn't a whole cross. It wasn't the, it wasn't the, the horizontal and the vertical beam. The, the cross was too heavy to carry from any man like that. So they strapped the beam across his back and they put a rope around his foot. And every time they would push and shove and slap and spit and pull on his beard. And every time, once in a, once in, once in a while, the soldiers would tug a rope to make him trip and fall. The Lord told me, Maurice, this is your beam, your beam that you are to cut out and you're to fashion. When, you, when, when, when I say that you will do greater things than I have done, you will carry people to the foot of the cross. 
this being, this being that you are to fashion with your hands. You will help build a space for those who don't know Christ. But the problem is, is when we start doing our work, when we start working hard, when we're working hard in the ways of the Lord, the devil sees what you're doing and he try to throw a roadblock so he, he, so he throw you off your game. No longer do I want to do for that wayward child. No longer can I put up with that sister. No longer will I, will I, will I respond to that brother. No, I will cut him off. We have lost our flavor. So he said, Maurice, you need to get back where you started. Well, how do I do it? The same way I gave you the first time. See, a lot of us think that when we cut somebody off, that, that we are through with them. As if it was our resources that was used to put them in a position to achieve. And they just, and they just wasted our resources and, 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 and went through with them. I will dare to tell you today that it never belonged to you in the first place. Those resources that you think you have are borrowed. And God lent them to you that you may do a work for him. So he told me, Maurice, though you think that you have lost it, I was there. You know, the funny thing about the story was when the man cried out after he lost the axe head, I never read that he was swinging the axe near Elijah. I never, read, I never read that Elijah was by him. But what it said is that he cried out. And all of a sudden, Elijah said, what's up? All you have to do is cry out. And the Savior will be right there. The Savior will be right there, right Johnny on the spot. What's up? I have lost the thing that I have borrowed from you. Lord, I have lost my zeal that I have borrowed from you. I have lost, Lord, my, 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 my drive, my passion that I have borrowed from you. I was wondering, how did the man, if he went to Elijah, find out where he lost it? The Lord said, Maurice, remember the last place that you were cutting. That tree, that brother, that sister. Go back to that spot. And in that spot, I will cast out my shadow, my cross. And I will allow that thing that you are borrowed to rise back to the top. That drive that you have, you will get again. That passion that you have, you will grasp again. That love that you once had for me, you will have again if you just show me and allow me to shadow over that spot. In closing. The Lord, the Lord wants to use you and I. The Lord wants so, so, so holy not only to save you, but to save others through you. That spot, that spot where the, where, where the axe head had failed, God will allow it to rise back up to the top. He will allow you to start back where you started from. So I tell you this, as the Lord has told me, you must now go back to that brother, to that sister, to that first love, right where you first started, and continue the work. Because we all, we all see the devastation of what the enemy is doing to our people, to our, to our world. We all see what is going on that is madness and mayhem. It seems like the Lord is nowhere in this world. The love of the Lord has waxed cold. It's our duty to go back 
when we have started. We must hate sin with a passion. We all have an ex, an ex to grind. I have an ex to grind. I have an older son that I must go and I have to seek him. Even if he don't want to spend time with me, I must get on his nerves. I must work his nerves. I must always be in his presence. I must go to the store where he works. I must be there for him. I would not let him go because I have an ex to grind. One day, one day, God is going to go to every last one of you and say, where's my sheep that I have lent you? Where are they? We all have an ax to grind. Our Father and our God.